Thank you for the invitation to talk about clinical experience with phototermal stimulation. So we have a, a big debate on how we should call this treatment. You know, conventionally people call subthreshold, and this is from the micropose experience, uh, but it's really uh, the term is not correct. I will talk a little bit why. And so we, we settle for phototermal stimulation. And I think that's the best way to approach. So we are going to talk about a little bit about novel approaches clinically with this kind of uh, st strategy. So, OK. So endpoint management, Daniel already talked about the basic science behind endpoint management. And so it's a method to allow uh, precise control of, of levels of dosage of sort durations and the thing that really defines it by management is the decision of what is the endpoint you want. So what's the endpoint? The endpoint could be also the threshold. So we have different thresholds. So, so we have different thresholds. So what's a threshold? So the threshold could be clinically visible threshold. So this is usually what people call sub-threshold. If they do see the burn, that's threshold. If they don't see the burn clinically, that's usually what they call sub-threshold. So if you see the, the literature, so there's a couple of trials, not really clinical trials, but uh, interventional case series, calling the, um, and comparing sub-threshold against threshold treatment with infrared and green and uh, a couple of yellow. So, but the, when you see the images, they're clearly damaged uh, in FA or in OCT. So the, their thresholds are clinically visible and they call sub threshold because it's invisible clinically. But if you go, for example, for angiography, OCT, and even if you go further to ORP viability, that's the endpoint you want. And that's what you need to decide before you treat. So we did a lot of experience, uh, experiments with rabbits to define these endpoints uh, clinically, OCT, FA, and histology, and we went to SEM, so scanning electron microscopy, uh, TEM for uh, transmission. So you already, we already discussed this graph. So this is the basis, the algorithm for the endpoint management. We want to be in this curve to always be in the treatment zone. So we want to treat the retina. We don't want to be below the treatment curve and not above, not to cause any damage. So this is the GI, so this is how we treat. So we first titrate and the thing about the titration, which is one of the most, most difficult parts from other treatments like micropose. I have a lot of experience with micropose also. And when we treat it with micropose, uh, we see the literature, uh, it's all over the place. So people use, there are some groups that do titrate some groups don't titrate. Some groups have one dose fits all. So they, they keep 750 milliwatts for every patient. Some people like uh, we used to do, we used to do a titration burn and we increase the power by 20%. Why? That's what worked for us. That's the recipe that worked for us. And so that's really not very reproducible. And that's the main criticism about micropose because is the reproducibility of the treatments between groups is very low. So this we try to avoid. So the decision of the titration, the 100% burn, so the nominal burn will be yes or no. So we do see the first barely visible burn we see, that's our 100%. So in three seconds, uh, and in these three seconds, we do see some faint, like little bird. That's our 100%. So we, we titrate this by power, keeping the duration by 15 millise milliseconds uh, or 20 milliseconds. But uh, we keep the duration stable and we go increasing power and that's our 100%. So this is 100% and then when you go to endpoint management software, we decrease this energy and then we don't know, the, the physician doesn't know uh, which power and which duration is being applied to the retina. And that's a good thing because usually the physicians don't know how to titrate. So they will maybe increase the power or decrease duration and that's the, when the confusion begins. So if you, if you keep this as energy, that's better. So you always keep in the curve and that's really uh, the, uh, the goal for endpoint management software. 
So then we treated, so this is the 100% burn, so it's visibly, barely visible clinically, really visible with FA and OCT, so this is 100%, so this we don't miss. And then when you go to 75, 50 and 30, we go and decrease our threshold, so we only see them as FA or OCT positive, then only OCT positive, and for 30%, we chose 30% because in 30% we only could find one cell once in a while, an OCM, uh, in the center of the burn. So this is something that it indicates that we did treat, so it did increase the heat as the computational model suggests. And we saw some indication morphologically, anatomically, that there's some tissue effect. So that's our goal. So we don't want to go below. We don't know that if you if you go uh, below that, if we are doing anything other than biochemical biochemical simulation of genes. So it's important to adjust the pattern density. That's a paper that uh, we published with Daniel. Also, the, the, that we, if you decrease our endpoints, our thresholds, for a moderate burn to a barely visible burn, the burn itself will decrease uh, the diameter. And if you go for a treatment like a PRP treatment, we need to adjust the density, so the spacing and the number of spots to treat the same area. And if it's the same thing for macula. So this is about ETDRS pattern, an ETDRS grid. So this is very intense burns, a lot of burns, very close to fovea. This is original ETDRS picture, so it's not from my group. So this is the original from the paper. And this is how, if you call I'm treating like ETDRS, you should be treating like this. No one's treat, no one treating like ETDRS anymore. But if you want to apply a treatment that mimics the gold standard, which is the best evidence we have even today of grid macular treatments, uh, we should use the same formula and treat with a larger number of spots and more uh, cl uh, close from each other. So then uh, I spent one year in uh, postdoc with the Dr. Palankar, a couple of lasers to, and to, um, to the research, and thanks again for Topcon for to, to giving us you know, the opportunity to work with this. Here in the back is the, the actually the endpoint management. This is the first Pascal. This is the infrared that I'm not, I'm not sure is doing work anymore. And so, but I changed for, from this setting to this setting, which this is, this is my clinic today. My, my Pascal is really close by to where I sit and talk to patients. So really I'm trying to use this as much as I can and with very good response, so, and this is the case. So, so far, we have about uh, 50, 58 patients treated, eyes treated, so mostly with DME and the central serous uh, chororetinopathy and BRV a couple of cases, and I've treated some ma macular telangiectasia. So, I'm not gonna talk much about m these patients here, so this is, more difficult cases, but they really they have not much uh, response to any other treatment. BRVO treats very well with uh, antigenics, but some patients cannot either afford or not uh, inject. So laser treatment for BRVO was the gold standard. It, it went to anti-VGF treatment, but um, we can try endpoint management of these patients too. DMA is really the most uh, number of cases that we have, so DMA have a lot of patients. In Brazil, still the insurance company don't pay for Lucentis for anti-VGF treatment, so there's a lot of patients that can af can't afford uh, injections, so we do treat a lot of photocoagulation, out of um, laser treatments, and we also believe that we should combine treatments with photo uh, either for the stimulation or for coagulation with anti-VGF treatment. So this is a different part of the story. And central serous, chronic central serous retinopathy, it's a disease that it's very hard to treat. So usually acute central serous retinopathy will resolve by itself. But if it doesn't resolve in four months or six months, depending on the criteria, it's called chronic. And there's really not much good uh, treatments for that. Some people use PDT. So Visudine, and it's very hard for the patient. It's a very expensive drug. It has a lot of side effects. And so really in Brazil, we don't use much. So there's conventional photocoagulation. If 
the spot it's away from the center of the macula and with chronic central, central serous close to fovea there's not much to do micropools has a good effect too and so i'm going to talk about about the, about the results so i have so far uh, uh, six months of follow-up so in this follow-up we do see a decrease in thickness of the ma central macular thick, uh, thickness in the in the OCT and both the, the maximum and the minimum so the, uh, the minimum thickness central thickness and most importantly the, re the vision will gain and the patients will um, regain vision in terms of ladders in the ETDRS uh, of course this is preliminary data this could change because some patients did not uh, reach the six months period yet but the preliminary data shows that there is a very good uh, gain in vision and the OCT although there's not much difference because the baseline is not thick enough to show a little difficulty uh, too much dif um, difference and especially because the normal retina in the spectralis OCT is about the central is about 300 microns and they start at 350 usually because the the detachment is extra foveal but and for DME we also see a decrease in the central macular thickness and uh, most importantly is the, the increase in terms of ladders of vision but again preliminary data only six months we should continue this uh, results uh, over time and then probably write uh, the report uh, the paper so again so this is is easier to explain uh, the with cases so let's start with central serous retinopathy so this is a 64 year old white uh, male that had decreased vision for eight months so really chronic central serous retinopathy uh, with 2060 and the point of leakage so we see this is the, the, the fundus picture and we see in the FA this is the point of leakage so in, at this area when you see in the OCT so this is actually the, the ICG and geography so we see a point of leakage very close to fovea and so this for conventional photocoagulation for intense moderate burns it's it's uh, it, you, can, you can't do this so what this is uh, the point of leakage really uh, almost on the fovea or just the fovea so and that's what's leaking so this is the serous detachment of the retina so this patient had this for at least eight months and so what we treat we treat with endpoint management so uh, our protocol it's basically uh, we use three, uh, 200 micron spot size uh, we use this lens which is one to one uh, aerial area to, to the retina uh, this was the power the, the power for the 100% burn which we can see as landmarks so these are the landmarks in patient retina so uh, we know that we treated from here to the fovea almost confluently so it's 0.25 spacing although we kept 50%, we only treated 50%, but uh, in terms of seeing the spots, it's almost confluently. So for physicians, it's very hard to go uh, beyond that, which is really one top of each other, so 0%, but I've done it and didn't see much difference in terms of, uh, of scarring and everything, anything. So we did 30%, uh, 0.25, landmarks on, and it was 538 burns, because this was a chronic, very hard uh, case. And this is the autofluorescence. So autofluorescence is a method of imaging that shows the lipofuxing of the RPE. So if we damage the, if we damage the cell, the RPE cell, or it will get, it get uh, increased lipofuxing, increased uh, external uh, outer segments inside um, the RP cell or in the space, this will be hyper autofluorescence. So usually where we do apply these barely visible burns, we see the hyper autofluorescent burn. If we apply too much energy, we might see hypo autofluorescent burns. And this is interesting because uh, these burns over here, these are the titration burns. So I usually apply either two, three or five to get my barely visible three seconds, they all look the same in terms of autofluorescence and they all look the same as the landmark. So that's good because that's very homogeneous, uniform treatment, that's what we want. We don't want to be intense here and not intense there. 
in terms of uh, the whole treatment. So I know that I don't see anything like this burns inside the grid it's because I'm using 30%. And so that's after, um, I don't know, one week, uh, maybe one, one month. But uh, this is the complete resolution of the fluid after the treatment with endpoint management. So, and this is the color, uh, the fundus picture. And we may, might see some of the landmarks here sure not a uh, scar not something that people will notice if you don't tell them and so this is a different case so this is a white female 61 year old years old so visual acuity 2060 and left eye for more than six months uh, she had a very strange uh, symptom she she said to me that she was uh, seeing butterflies that's what, that was her uh, symptoms and it's amazing that after the treatment, the butterflies went away and never came back. But uh, that was the symptom. And that was because that she had this kind of fluid. So that's a lot. So this is the, um, the she had this at least for, for six months as she refers the symptoms, symptoms. And this is a very chronic central serous. If you see the autofluorescence, we have hyper autofluorescent area all over this part of the retina so it's the the fluid will come down and they treated with uh, 520 burns uh, spots landmarks on again and the same panel a little bit more power 120 milliwatts and so after the treatment so this is the baseline and then after uh, one month two months the vision increased and this is after uh, four months and the complete resolution and this we can see the whole area not only the fovea but the whole area of fluid resolved and so that's why sometimes you see the center doesn't resolve that much because most of the detachment was here so this part here was the most area of thickening so this is 2020 uh, so this is a different case. Uh, this is a male, 32 year old, white, 2050. So again, very close to the fovea. So we could only treat this with either PDT, micropulse, and now with endpoint management. So this is the fluid, the subretinal fluid. Again, after one month, a very good result. And so this is a very interesting case because this is bilateral central serous retinopathy. And this patient had these symptoms. He said at least for six months, it's very hard for them to really point when it started, but he came to me and had bilateral uh, central serous. This is the area of the this fluid and also the PED, so the pigment epithelial detachment and very bolus uh, detachment so we can see here very you know the area of fluid we treated uh, with endpoint management so this is the the pigment detachment with fluid on the side so what the, what is the treatment strategy that i use the oct to actually mark the whole area of fluids and we applied with landmarks on so we can see it's very hard to see but if I point it's easier we can actually see the landmarks on so and this is the resolution of the right eye so uh, 2100 to go to 2020 and it's very hard to see and if you go to the to the PED the PED also went away and that's how it uh, how it responded the right eye with only one treatment the left eye was uh, harder so this is the the final so the left eye was a harder case it was above the fovea so this is the point of leakage and also so we have here the area so it's detaching the fovea and this is the pattern so i, I had to apply more uh, burns to actually cover the whole area of hyper autofluorescence and so the also landmarks on so we can see in the whole uh, multimodal imaging and this is slower uh, response so we got here and so we attached the whole area in the posterior pole but if when we saw the area of leakage 
So this is, but when you saw here, this was where the area of leakage was. This did not respond in the first treatment, so we had to retreat. So we retreated only this area here, and that's gone. So this is a complete resolution after, so this is after eight months. So we have eight months here with not only complete resolution, but stability from the treatment since the beginning. And okay, so for, so for this is for central serous. For DME, Daniel already showed this slide, so this is not actual spots. So this is more or less what, uh, how we do it. I actually do treat closer here. We only, do, we only uh, don't place burns 500 uh, microns through the disc, so we actually we can treat at the papilla macular bundle like this. So this is a case for diabetic macular edema, 54, uh, 54 years old, white, uh, with DME for more over 15 years. This patient had bilateral disease, very severe disease. He, can, uh, he couldn't afford any anti-angiogenic uh, drugs. Insurance uh, don't pay for him. And so we treat it with uh, first conventional, like focal, uh, the photocoagulation with no success. And then, so this is the, the OCT before we treat it with uh, endpoint management. So it's a very cystic macular edema in the left eye. So this, again, landmarks on uh, 110, so 760 burns. And well, this is the autofluorescence again. And this is, so this is the baseline OCT after one and two months. So interesting that in OCT, we can see the landmark so actually, the landmark will cause uh, damage to, to the RPE, a little bit of photoreceptors, and this form here is very interesting because it, this is in the posterior pole, in the macula, and this is how the, the nuclei and the photoreceptors will connect to the outer plexiform layer. But when you go for one month and two months, they are gone. So we can see in vivo and in patients, not uh, only experimentally, that the laser burn will restore, so we, there's a healing process for photocoagulation. So even with the landmarks, which are photocoagulation burns, uh, they will heal. And we only see the, the spots in the infrared or autofluorescence uh, because of the RP um, proliferation or damage that we cause, not really photoreceptor damage. So the vision got better and keep getting better. So this is the central, macular, the central part of the fovea and the vision got 20, 25 and this is after six months. And it's very hard to see it uh, clinically and with the infrared we do see the landmarks. So that's a good thing because it's not real readily uh, visible clinically but if you want to see where we treat it some physicians even for legal pro purposes or uh, sometimes they they refer to colleagues and they say no no you you, you did, they didn't treat you with laser I don't see anything for this kind of patients uh, patients and physicians maybe to have like a, a signature like a landmark maybe it's good so clinically doesn't matter much if you treat a confluent the whole posterior pole these um, burns here won't affect the result, even when the fact vision. So this is a different case for uh, the um, diabetic macular edema, very severe macular edema, and this patient had uh, what is called subretinal fluid, which is a uh, which is indication of really bad cl clinical control and bad control for the macular edema, and we did tr we treat her with the endpoint management and the edema resolved over time and that he had a very, she had a very nice result and this fluid almost gone, the vision got better, a little, couple of cysts, but not as in baseline. So this is more or less the, the cases. So thank again for the invitation and we're open for questions.